I'm going to read a, a couple of short pieces from uh, my book, Portrait with Keys, which is a kind of documentary text about Johannesburg. Um, consists of a, about 140 short pieces. They were published in sequences over a period of about eight years before they were assembled into a single book. Um, the book is concerned with different aspects of city life uh, in Johannesburg. One of those uh, aspects, of course, is security. Uh, as I'm sure some of you know, Johannesburg is a rather uh, threatening city and people are very concerned about their personal safety. So I'm going to read a short piece and a slightly longer piece which have to do with uh, that particular question. And the first piece is actually the opening section of the book. When a house has been alarmed, it becomes explosive. It must be armed and disarmed several times a day. When it is armed by the touching of keys upon a pad, it emits a whine that sends the occupants rushing out, banging the door behind them. There are no leisurely departures. There is no time for second thoughts, for taking a scarf from the hook behind the door, for checking that the answering machine is on, for a final look in the mirror on the way through the hallway. There are no save at home comings either. You do not unwind into such a house, kicking off your shoes, breathing the familiar air. Every departure is precipitate. Every arrival is a scraping in. In an alarmed house, you awake in the small hours to find the room unnaturally light. The keys on the touch bed are aglow with a luminous clinical green, like a nightlight for a child who's afraid of the dark. Um, the second piece is a slightly lighter piece. Um, and uh, concerns the, ki the kind of relationships that one establishes with security guards in South Africa, which are some of the most significant relationships in your life. We have left the security arrangements for my birthday party until the last minute, resisting the imposition of it, hoping the problem will resolve itself. Once your responsibilities as host extended no further than food and drink and a bit of mood music, now you must take steps to ensure the safety of your guests and their property. I think it's irresponsible of us to have a dinner party at all, I say to Minky. There should be a municipal bylaw that only people with long driveways and big dogs are allowed to entertain. We should call the whole thing off. It'll be fine, she says, just stop obsessing. The last time we had people over, I had to keep going outside to check that their cars were still there. It spoiled my evening. We'll get a guard, she says. She phones the armed response people. It is too late, all their guards are booked. But they recommend the Academy of Security, where trainees are registered for on-the-job experience. She phones the Academy. Yes, they do supply security guards for single functions. A dinner party, seven-ish, can do. That will be the half-shift deal, unless you want him to stay past midnight and pay the full shift rate. Being inexperienced, the guard cannot be armed, of course, but he will be under constant supervision. They can arrange an armed guard from another company, probably, but at such short notice it will be more expensive, you understand. We settle for inexperienced, unarmed, half-shift. The security costs more than the food, I say, and he's still an apprentice. We should have gone to a restaurant. The apprentice security guard is called Bongi. So far, he has only acquired the top half of a uniform, a navy blue tunic that is too short in the sleeve. The checked pants and down at heel shoes are clearly his own. By way of equipment, he has a large silver torch and a panic button hanging around his neck. My theory is that he is earning the uniform, item by item, as payment or incentive. After six months or so, he'll be fully qualified 
and fully clothed. I knew this was a bad idea, I said to Minky. He's just a kid. Bongi is standing under a tree on the far side of the road. He looks vulnerable and lonely. It is starting to drizzle. Minky takes him an umbrella from a stand at the door, the grey and yellow one with a handle in the shape of a toucan, which once belonged to her dad. With this frivolous thing in his hand, Bongi looks even more poorly equipped to cope with the streets. This is unforgivable, I say. This is a low point. I'd rather live in a flat than do this. What difference would that make, Minky says. She always sees through my rhetoric. People have still got to park their cars somewhere. A complex then. I'd rather live in a complex, some place with secure parking. The guests begin to arrive. Bongi waves the torch around officiously and then stands on the pavement under the toucan umbrella, embarrassed. When dinner is served, Minky takes out a plate of food and a cup of coffee. The poor kid's starving, she says, when she comes back. Excusing myself from the table on the pretext of fetching more wine from the spare room, I sneak outside and gaze at him from the end of the stoop. He's squatting on the curb with a plate between his feet on the tar, eating voraciously. He's a sitting duck, I say to her in the kitchen when we're dishing up seconds. What the hell is he expected to do if an armed gang tries to steal one of the cars, God forbid? Throw the panic button at them. This whole arrangement is immoral, especially our part in it. Our friends are insured anyway. If someone steals Bronco's car, he'll get another one. What if this kid gets hurt while we're sitting here, feeding our faces and moaning about the crime rate? I think he'll have seconds too. With a plate of Thai chicken under his belt, and another in prospect, Bongi is looking better. We exchange a few words. He comes from a farm near Marikana, out near the Mahalisburg, and he's been in Joburg since June. His uncle found him this job. His uncle has been a full-time security for five years. He looks quite pleased with himself. Perhaps he's thinking, this is not such a bad job after all. But we cannot see it that way. At 10.30, Minky calls him inside to watch the cars from the stoop over the wall. When the supervisor arrives an hour later, there's a hullabaloo. You've got to maintain standards, he says, especially when you're training these guys. You can't have them getting soft on the job. That's it, we say to one another afterwards. No more parties. Never again. Um, How long shall I read for? Another 10 minutes or so? <laughs> um, let me... Let me read just a couple of pages from the start of a, a story called The Lost Library. Um, this book came about a couple of years ago when I was working my way through notebooks, as I quite frequently do in search of a, an idea for a novel. And uh, I was struck by the number of ideas in my notebooks over 20 or 30 years that had never been completed. So the failed ideas the, and the, the, the incomplete drafts became, became interesting to me. And uh, I wrote a, a set of essays, um, which are, I suppose, verging on fiction, but they're really explorations of why these particular ideas failed as fictions. And embedded in the heart of the book is a story, which is clearly a fiction, and it's a Borgesian story about uh, a library in which all the unwritten works of fiction in the world are stored. So it's a kind of homage to Borges. I'll just read the first couple of pages. She's pretty, this librarian, the young man thinks, sun-browned and outdoorsy, with none of the papery pallor he associates with the profession. Perhaps she goes water skiing or horse riding on the weekend, or perhaps she has interests even more at odds with book tending, like fire eating or sword play. Her high heels are as sharp as nails. Not very sensible, he thinks. We don't need to be sensible here, she says. 
This way, please. He follows her down a corridor, his eyes on her supple calves, and they stop before a locked door. She takes a key from a pocket on a dust coat, pauses for effect, he supposes, and unlocks the door. The room beyond is long and narrow. Parquet gleams underfoot as if winter sunlight is falling from high windows, although the walls are blank. Against the far wall is a glass-fronted cabinet. In the doorway, the librarian steps out of her heels into a large pair of sheepskin slippers and motions the young man to do the same. There are a dozen pairs moored like dinghies to the skirting board. He stoops to unlace his boots, but she tells him not to bother, and so he hunts for the largest pair of slippers and steps into them, boots and all. It is impossible to walk normally in the loose-fitting slippers. They have to shuffle. In slow, gliding steps, they cross to the cabinet. We like to start here, she says, because the idea is easy to grasp. She pauses so that he can take in the books behind the glass before she goes on with the cheery authority of a tour guide. These are the lost books, the ones that would have been written had their writers not died young arranged alphabetically and classified by cause of death. A wave of her slender hand. <coughs> Accidental death, bruise of course, disease, those old standbys, consumption and syphilis, and the new one, AIDS, a growing collection. Duels, little sign of growth there. Murder accidents, murder, suicide. A disproportionate number of rations in Japanese, as you'd expect and quite a few of your countrymen, and women too. The young man leans closer to the glass and a misty speech bubble forms before his mouth. Any special interests, she asks, poetry or prose, the mature work of Keats, that's a draw card. He looks at the regular rows of plain, sturdy spines. He cannot make out the titles, the words run together as he reads them. Looking for someone in particular, Bruno Schultz, the Polish, I know who he is. Lovely choice, very popular. He'll be down there among the war dead. Let's see, Scoen, Skaterfude, Shulman, quite a roll call, and none of them known, known at all, I'm sorry to say. All turned up their toes before they published the book. NIP, see the green dot, that means never in print. If you knew half of what we'd lost, you'd run out of here weeping. Here we are, Schultz, B, these six little volumes. He wipes the misty bubble away with his fingertips and looks at a row of identical <coughs> leaf green books. He makes out the author's name on the spines because he knows what he's looking at, but the titles blur and fade. Squinting does not bring them into focus. May I look at one of them? Oh no, that's not allowed at all. If you were a close relative, let's say a brother or a son, we might make an exception and let you hold something for a minute under strict supervision. Once a year we open the cabinets for dusting and I can't tell you what a performance it is. If a cleaner were to nick a book off the shelf and they try their luck of course because they think the books are full of dirty pictures, we've been hot water. Why is that? Well, when a reader opens one of these books, it has consequences in others. Things are shaken up. Matters that appear to be settled are reopened for discussion. The extent of the disruption depends on the book. There are certain slim volumes of poetry, minor novels in little red languages, ephemeral chapbooks and pamphlets and the like, the reading of which would hardly cause a ripple. Open one of them, let its influence be felt for a moment, and a line or two might change in all the world's libraries. If such works had actually been written, published and read in good time, they might have exerted some small pressure on a corner of the real. There is scarcely a writer so unoriginal or unloved that he is not read by his friends and family, at worst by his rivals. But the effect is so slight it can hardly be felt. And then there are others with the power to change everything. These later works by Kafka, for instance, the disappointing end of his career. He wasn't up to much in his 60s, I believe. He was hardly even Kafkaesque. Not that I've read any of them myself, they're under lock and key. I am familiar, though, with the unwritten work of Skaterfuda, the Frisian modernist, whom you met a moment ago, 
but can't be expected to recall. Completely unknown, of course, because he drowned at the age of 17. Terrible business. He fell through the ice while skating on some frozen canal. Open Odysseus, his unwritten masterpiece, and entire books melt away under the reader's eye. Schools of imitators dwindle to nothing. Towers of study guides topple over in the shops. It was after reading Odysseus that Joyce abandoned Ulysses and started working on Mulligan. But the less said about that, the better. You can imagine the trouble you would cause if you let such a book out of its cage. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> I should read something from the folly, right? <laughs> that's, why, that's mainly why I'm here, right? <laughs> I'm just going to read a very short, this is really two pages from the folly, which is my first novel, um, published in 1993, and now um, gloriously reissued, I think, by Archipelago. Um, certainly the most attractive uh, publication that I've had. I'm very delighted that uh, Archipelago have um, the confidence to publish the book again. It's really wonderful for me. Um, just to tell you briefly where this scene fits into the book, um, at the beginning, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Malchas are living very settled suburban lives in their home, and a stranger called Nevenez arrives on the plot next door and clears away all the grass and uh, begins to map out with nails and string the plan of a new house and uh, he slowly draws Mr. Malchas into his project um, and Mr. Malchas's problem is that he can't actually visualize the house that Nevenazen is, is introducing to him um, and this is a key moment in the book where he finally thinks that he gets it he finally understands the plan After several weeks, Mr. Malchas' single-minded dedication to maintenance produced an unexpected result. One evening, he was kneading a scoop of wintergreen into a fibrous knot near the heart of the plan when he noticed a breeze block lying on the ground nearby. He looked at it in surprise, naturally, whereupon it vanished without trace. How often in his thankless quest for the new house, at first under Nivenez and Stutelich, latterly on his own, had Malchas yearned for just such a keystone? How often had its absence weighed heavily on his mind? Yet now, when the key finally appeared, he could not grasp it. It must be a practical joke, he thought. Someone's pulling my leg. But this was not borne out by the evidence. There were no mirrors to be seen, no giveaway wires, no burning cigarette ends. Nowhere on the carefully swept plot was there a single mark that Malchas could not account for. No footprint, no telltale gouge or scrape. Finding his way cautiously to the scene of the appearance, or rather the disappearance, as he thought of it, he went down on his hands and knees and examined the surface closely. But the breeze block itself had left no impression. He was forced to dismiss it as a figment of his imagination, a side effect of stress and overwork. Wasn't he holding down two jobs? He didn't breathe a word to Mrs. The following evening's shift held no surprises. But the day after was a Saturday, and he was obliged to spend the whole afternoon tending the plan. Towards sunset, he was sweeping with the grass broom when a ghostly balustrade floated into view some five meters above the ground, and dependent upon nothing at all. A less steadfast man might have taken to his heels, but Malchas stood firm. He even had the presence of mind not to confront the apparition directly. He sensed danger. He saw himself turned to stone. So he maintained the steady rhythm of his sweeping and watched the floating balustrade out of the corner of his eye. It shimmered and shimmied and emitted a halo of brilliant light. It faded and was on the point of vanishing altogether, but as Malchas's heart skipped a beat, it glowed again with new intensity and appeared to stabilize and solidify somewhat. It grew a landing. 
It excreted a film of crimson linoleum. It oozed wax. Then it gave birth to a flight of stairs, each riser condensing in incandescent vapor and toppling in slow motion from the edge of the tread above it, shuffling languidly into place. The handrails of the grand staircase curved gracefully, uncoiling like stems, and progressed slowly down to the ground. A pool of yellow light seeped out, gathered itself, and extruded from its syrupy depths five strips of Oregon pine which hovered just above the surface. They came closer. He smelled wax and sawdust. They eased in below the speeding bristles of his broom. The bristles chased over the floorboards and scared clouds of lemon-scented dust out of the cracks. Malchas let out his breath with a whoosh. He cast aside his broom, dispersing the staircase into a haze of ordinary dust motes, and launched himself across the plan in an ecstasy, whooping with joy and bellowing to wake the dead. I can see. I can see. Thanks.